Hello and welcome again to our series on uh, Gems of the Alsha, um, the Alsha Kokodish, and uh, we're now up to the very exciting and dramatic centre of Pinchas, uh, or the aftermath of Pinchas's actions. If you remember, there was a revolt in the camp led by somebody called Zimri, who was the head of the tribe of Shimon, and ultimately there is a plague that breaks out, killing thousands of Jews. And it's the actions of Pinchas who uh, takes revenge, I suppose, on behalf of God in killing the perpetrator and his uh, co-conspirator uh, that caused the outbreak in the first place. That was, of course, the end of last week's Sedra. But this week's Sedra uh, leads us to some really interesting insights from the Alshak. Um, it's huge, it's long, but uh, we're only doing one gem a week, but really we've got a treasure house. So let's just remind ourselves of what the story says. So that's the Pasha of Pinchas. Um, if you are following it or looking in the, the art scroll, it's page 876. And for those of you who uh, like chapters of the Midbar, the Book of Numbers, it's uh, chapter 25. And it starts at verse 11, so it's a continuation from the story in the previous Pasha, the previous part of the Tower, it's not new. Let's see what it says. It says, V'edab Hashem el Moshe, and God speaks to Moshe, and they're not to say, Pinchas, Pinchas ben Lozer ben Aaron Pinchas, the son of Lozer, the son of Aaron Akon, Heshev is come in Elbene Israel. He's removed my anger by his actions from the Jewish people. Vakano is kimosi besoikon, because he uh, was zealous on my behalf, with perhaps his translation, Velokilisi has been Israel, and I didn't wipe out the Jewish people as a consequence of what happened. So I'm going to give them a bris shalom, a covenant of peace. And that's very mysterious. What exactly is this covenant of peace? Now from here, uh, the al asks lots and lots of questions, but I'm really going to focus on one, maybe two. And the first thing he wants to know, again, it's a, it's a careful reading of the verse. Let's read the verse again. God speaks to Moshe and Lemar to say, to say what? Next verse. Pinchas ben Eloza ben Aaron and Cohen. And then it talks about Pinchas, the star of the show, if you like, the hero of the of the Parsha. Pinchas ben Eloza, the son of Aaron, the son of 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 of, uh, of the Cohen, Aaron the Cohen, removed my anger from the Jewish people. But that's a new story. That's saying what he did. But what's he got to say? So he says something very interesting. Um, it says at the previous center when the actual incident began. The Yar Pinchas, Pinchas saw, and there it repeats who he is. So let's go back a little bit. So if you want to turn back to 874, or that's chapter 25, that's where we are in, and it's 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 verse 7. The Yar Pinchas ben Eloza ben Aaron And Pinchas ben, so he told us he'd been Eloza ben Aaron And what did he see? So there's a principle which the Alsha talks about, which is stated in the Talmud, that when a Jew I suppose you could argue any human being um, does a mitzvah, because non-Jewish people, as we'll talk about in a second, are also obliged to keep mitzvahs, their own mitzvahs. Um, same way as Kohanim, priests have got their specific mitzvahs, and Levim have their mitzvahs, mitzvahs for a king, mitzvahs for women, mitzvahs for men, mitzvahs for non-Jews. Um, when a person does a mitzvah, then there's a blessing we make beforehand which says, Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you, Hashem, asher kiddushon of a mitzvah, so, who makes me holy, by doing my mitzvahs, by doing your mitzvahs. The mitzvah that you do, the act of doing something that God asks you to do, imbues you with a certain degree of holiness. And there's a general principle that uh, the mitzvahs, 613 mitzvahs, parallel various parts of the body. The mitzvah split into 248 do's and 365 don'ts. The Talmud classically splits those into the 248 bones of the body, 365 sinews, whether that's scientifically rigorous given the way that uh, these are uh, assessed or identified today i'm not sure but anyway the idea is when you do amidst the parallels that part of the body then you're able to as it were sanctify imbue holiness in that part of the body if you use your hand to do kindness it's the signing of a check it's giving money it's picking somebody up who's fallen down then you're imbuing that hand with holiness so what did pinkus see so in the end of last week's cedra in verse seven, the Yar Pinchas ben Lozban Ara Cohen, the Yakum Metach Eida, and he gets up from the from the congregation. Yikach Ramach beYadoi, and he takes his Ramach. Now Hebrew, the word Ramach means a spear, and then of course he kills them. But it's more than that. Ramach is spelt here without one letter, which we normally have, which is a vav, which leaves us with Reish Mem Ches. 
248. That means in this action, which he fully anticipates he's going to be killed for, there's going to be a huge backlash and rejection of his actions, a great doubting of his sincerity, the likelihood, like Aaron's son Hur, who refused to make the golden calf and was killed for it, he thinks that the Jewish people will kill him, doubting his, his sincerity and what he did, and that it was for God rather than his own motivations, whatever they would be, in willing to sacrifice all of himself, then that imbues holiness in all of himself, not just one body, part of the body, but all of his body. Now, let's go back to our question. God speaks to Moses, speaks to Moses to say, to say what? Don't think that Pincus's actions were due to any ulterior or selfish motives, no. To tell you he was Pincus, the son of Eloza, the son of Aaron the Cohen. That their tradition, their reputation, their motivation was manifest through him as well. Now that's a very important idea. In other words, Pincus did what he did for the right reasons. And he's given a brief shalom. So the word Lemar tells him, it tells you what he said. Our question was, you have a Lemar? To say what? To say that he's Pincus ben Lazar and the Cohen. And interestingly, by the way, um, the Kohanim who were, who were meant who were, when the, the Kahuna, the priesthood, was established in the Jewish people, Aaron and his children, who were going to be appointed there, were, well, they became the Kohanim. But Pinchas had already been born. He wasn't part of that process. Now he becomes a Kohan in his own right. He gets a Bris Shalom. But more than that, the rabbis famously say, and I think we all know now, that the Bris Shalom is that he never dies. Um, he lives on and re-emerges all the way through Jewish history, but more famously, Elijah the prophet, Eliha Novi, Talmud says, that was Pinchas. That was another, as it were, chapter in his story, incarnation, if you like, of his, of his life. And that's interesting. I find that extremely interesting. Therefore, he gets a new name. And as a thought that's been going through my mind just this week, um, the, Mash the Mashiach, the Messiah, is a descendant, of course, of King David. And King David, of course, is a great grandson of somebody called Rus. Uh, Rus has got a very interesting name because Rus, again, we're playing numbers. Uh, if you count out the, the letters, the numerical letters, the value of the letters, remember every Hebrew letter has got a, a numerical value. The first letter, Aleph, is one. The second letter, base, is two. So that means that all the letters spell out numbers which are significant and part of our tradition. Rus comes to 606. There are 613 mitzvahs, but non-Jewish people are already obliged to keep 600 and, uh, to keep seven of the, uh, of the mitzvahs. So therefore, if you add 606 to 7, you get 613. By becoming Jewish, you then took on the complete number of mitzvahs a human being can be obliged to keep, and therefore her name was Rus. Her 606 added to her 7 to be the 613. Nice idea. So that wasn't her real name. It was the name she, that defined her after she became great. And of course, her mother-in-law in the story is called Nomi. What was her real name? Rashi and the other commentators say that Nomi was called Nomi because everybody said she is so naim. Naim the Hebrew word for pleasant or beautiful or wonderful. So it was the name that people gave her. It was a nickname, Sobriki. Right? She was pleasant, the pleasant one. But what was her real name? I don't actually know what her real name was. I've looked it up a few times. I can't actually find that. How about Shimshin? We read about Shimshin uh, in the synagogue a few weeks ago, the story of Shimshin. Remember the mother who couldn't have any children. The angel appears to her and, um, and tells her she's going to have a child. Yeah, the angel appears twice. What was she called? I saw some rabbi online in uh, the Jewish press, which I write for, uh, wanted to explain why her name uh, is not explicit and not mentioned in the Bible. And he says that natural fact her name was um, Talophonis. Talophonis, which indeed her name was. Um, but it's just that, if I hope the rabbi will forgive me, that wasn't her name. That was the name that was given to her as a consequence of ponis, is the Hebrew for, for face, tzal is to see, two lavens, tzalel. She saw an angel twice. So that was the name she was given when she saw an angel twice. What about her real name? Or, to keep the same theme, Avraham. Avraham wasn't his real name. His real name, or his first name, I should say, was Avraham, but it gets changed. Sorai became Sora. Yaakov, 
becomes Israel, and Pinchas becomes Eliyahu. I think there's a very important message here. Indeed, people are given names at birth, and a name is hugely important in Judaism. We say, all your, we believe all your potential is hidden within your name. The name you're given is the name that, I, that heaven suggested you should give. Hebrew names contain the, the potential, both good and bad, of the carrier of that name. But what did you do with that potential? What did you do with the name? Did you turn it into something bigger and greater? Did you realize that potential? Did you change your name? Or did you change your status? Did you change the way people saw you? That people said about Nomi, she is so wonderful. Or people said about Pincus, Elio. Did you become somebody much greater? So the name that you have is only your starting point. Your greatness is not defined by your background, although Pincus had an incredible background. Your greatness is defined by what you did with that background. In Pincus's case, he changes everything by the mitzvah that he did, the commandment that he fulfilled of Kiddush Hashem, saving the entire Jewish people, sanctifying God's name, fully expecting to be killed as a consequence. Then he changes. He imbues everything about him with holiness. That deserves a new title. That deserves a new name. And that defines the person. I'm not really interested in who I was, says Judaism. I'm interested in who I became, who I made myself. There was a time when I could hardly walk and I stumbled and my mother picked me up and changed my diapers and fed me and stuff like that. So what? But what sort of human being did you go on to grow to become? That defines who Jew is. In Pincus's case, he defined himself in the ultimate way possible. And God rewards him by giving a brief shalom. And that's what Moshe is supposed to lay more to say to the Jewish people. This person, he became something special. He needs a new name. Good job.